Today, we're going to talk about, as promised, the Eightfold Path. At the beginning of January, we started talking about the Four Noble Truths. And we talked about how these were the original teachings of the Buddha. And that every teaching that came after the Four Noble Truths was in support of the Four Noble Truths. In fact, there was once an, uh, an ascetic who once summarized, and I'm summarizing the summary, um, summarized the Buddha's teaching as, the Buddha has taught us the cause and cessation of suffering. So in a nutshell, that's what Buddhism is. That's all Buddhism is, teaching us what are what is the cause and the cessation of suffering. We talked about how the first noble truth was in life there is suffering. So we talked about the universality of suffering, that we all suffer. It is what binds us to this universe. It is what binds us to each other. It's that common ground that we all have. We talked about the second noble truth, which is there is a cause to suffering. And that that cause is typically ignorance, desires, uh, attachments, and aversions. And I told you last week, or the I told you the second, uh, second week of January, a really good way of a good practice to try out is when you find yourself suffering, ask yourself, what am I desiring? And then the third noble truth was simply that there is a cure to suffering, that there is a end, a cessation to suffering, that there is hope that you are not destined to have to suffer. You don't have to suffer. And I briefly discussed the idea that pain is inevitable, but that suffering is optional. You will experience emotional pain and physical pain and psychological pain. That's inevitable, but the suffering is optional. And so then the Buddha prescribed um, how you cease suffering. And that was the fourth, fourth noble truth, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. <clears throat> now, before I get into the details of the Noble Eightfold Path, just sort of big picture first of what the Noble Eightfold Path is. And it's basically the idea was, if the first noble truth, there is suffering, is a diagnosis of a disease, and the second noble truth is what is the cause of that disease. And the third noble truth is saying there is a treatment for the disease. And the eightfold noble path is the prescription, the, the actions that we are to take to help cease suffering. Now I'd go, I want to go deeper into that last thing. Ultimately, the goal is to end all suffering. But it is progress, it is a, a victory of sorts, if you can also end suffering temporarily. And so you want to get into the practice of ending suffering, even if just temporarily, because the more practice you get into ending suffering, the better you get at it and the less you will suffer. And hopefully the ultimate goal is to eliminate all suffering. Now, when you hear noble, eightfold path, the word noble doesn't mean that only royalty are allowed to follow this path. Um, noble as in something that is optimal, something that is paramount, something that is uh, ideal. And so this is the ideal path. This is the, the optimal path. And what we're trying to do is achieve progress in each of these eight steps. I'm sorry, steps is the wrong word because you don't really achieve them in order. And actually that leads me then to the next thing. I want you to picture a ball, any ball, soccer ball, the ball they used to get pegged at in, in PE class and recess uh, while playing uh, dodgeball, uh, tennis ball, whatever ball. And if that ball were to be floating in the air in front of you, and I were to ask you, where's the beginning? 
you probably look at me perplexed. There is no beginning to a ball. You know, maybe if I point at one spot, that can be my beginning, but that is not necessarily the beginning of the ball. The same holds true with this Eightfold Noble Path. It is like a ball. And even though there are eight parts to it, um, the truth is that they're all so interconnected with each other that there is no beginning. There are no steps. You don't start with one, two, three, and four and keep going that way. Um, you, and it, and what ends up happening is that you end up working on all of them. You may emphasize one because it might be easier and that's a good place to start. Um, but inevitably, because of the interconnectedness of these eight, if you work on one, you are working on the others. And if you, it is said in the sutras, the Buddhist scriptures, that if you perfect one, you have perfected the others. That is how interconnected they are. You cannot just achieve one of them without achieving the others. And even that word achieve, I should <laughs> avoid. Um, in our culture, we are so achievement oriented. But the achievement orientation becomes an obstacle in the Buddhist practice. The better word is to uncover. The idea is that we already know these eightfold path. We already are Buddha. We are already enlightened, but we are asleep. And so we are seeking to become woke, right? awakened. That's what the word Buddha means, awakened one. And the idea is that each of us are Buddhas to be. We just haven't been woken. Right? So as we uncover these things for ourselves, um, the image that I want you to think about is a jewel that is um, covered in mud. And as you slowly start to wipe some of the mud off um, and the grit, uh, the jewel starts to peer out. And the better and better you get at cleaning this jewel, the more it shines, the more brilliant it becomes, the more beautiful it becomes. And so this is you. You are a jewel covered in mud and rock and grit, um, dirt, grease, whatever. And you are slowly wiping away at this jewel whenever you engage in the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path, and let me read through really quick what those eight are, and then I'm going to break it down. So the Eightfold Path are right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right thought, and right understanding. So I'll go through them one more time. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right thought, and right understanding. And here, right is not, does not mean the uh, same as right or wrong. Um, again, it comes, it, it kind of alludes to the idea of the, uh, the perfect way, the ideal way, the optimal way. Okay. The, um, try to think what another good word would be. But it's not meant to be like doing the opposite is wrong necessarily. Um, it's just that if you, the better you are at the at engaging and incorporating these eight, um, the more enlightened you will become. The more you will be cleaning off that jewel within. Now these eight can be divided into three sections, and what I'm going to do is next week I will cover the first section. And then um, in March, when we get our first two weeks in March, I'll cover the last two sections. Um, and then, uh, because in Fe the third week, third Tuesday of February, we'll have another parable. But uh, for today, I just want to give the overview of the Eightfold Path. And then next week, we will start with the first section, which is 
morality. And so you can divide the Eightfold Path into the morality path, the mental development path, and the wisdom path. So morality, mental development, and wisdom. And in the morality path falls the right speech, the right action, the right li livelihood. In the mental development is the right effort, the right mindfulness, and the right concentration. And then in the wisdom path is the right understanding and the right thought. I'll give you a warning. If you Google this and look at the different, um, and just Google Eightfold Path, you will find a whole bunch of different lists um, with different words and different meanings, but they all kind of capture the same meaning. And so when you do this, when you uh, do engage in learning about the Eightfold Path elsewhere, remember that this is like a ball. And so it's, it's very hard to distinguish which is the beginning, which is the middle, and which is the end of this ball, because it's not there. And that's, that's why when you look up the Eightfold Path in different areas, they'll be described slightly differently. So these divisions in eight is not meant to be dogmatic. It's not meant to be a commandment from high above. Um, it's not meant to be taken literally. These are guides. And as you start to deepen your understanding of the Eightfold Path, you'll understand why it's not eight, why it's really just one interconnected path, the middle way, which is what the Buddha eventually got to. But if you're going to find this path, find this middle way, we need an endpoint or a goal, and we need to take the first steps. And so the, I, the Eightfold Path is often likened to a journey up a mountain. You may see the top of the mountain, but you're not there yet. And you're not going to get there yet until you take the first step. And as you take the first step and the next, um, you start to slowly develop understanding of these eight paths, which is actually one path. Along the journey, you will find, um, and this happened to me once in real life, and it was so, it, it gave me like a aha moment. I was hiking up the Guadalupe Mountain uh, in West Texas, and I had a fifty-five pound pack. Don't know why. <laughs> I just didn't have really uh, uh, light gear with me. So I was hiking up the mountain with a fifty-five pound pack. And I kept saying, all right, there's the peak. As soon as I get to the peak, I, I can rest. And so that, that was my motivation. I kept going, kept trotting. I kept pushing, kept taking. I just did skip one more step. Good. Now another step and just keeping taking those steps. Until I got to the peak and realized that was not the real peak. The peak was higher up. <laughs> you will have that in this journey, in this path of uh, enlightenment. You will have moments that you feel you have reached the peak and then realize, oh, my God, the peak is a little higher up than I thought. Uh, you will have ups and downs and you will have moments of respite, moments of rest that you will need. Um, but inevitably, as long as you keep pushing forward, as long as you keep putting one step in front of the other, uh, you will reach the peak. And just like my journey up the Guadalupe Mountain, um, reaching the peak just feels good. It, it, it is wonderful to be up there. And so the idea of enlightenment is that we should have a reduction, a cessation of our suffering. And once we reach the peak, it will feel good. We'll know that we've made it. The first part of the Eightfold Path, and this is the part that I will go in more deeply uh, next week, but I want to at least start talking about why this is typically the first part. So typically, the ones that we first start talking about are the morality or good conduct uh, paths. And refresh your memory, those are right speech, right action, and right livelihood. 
And briefly, right speech is being able to use your words in a constructive way, not in a destructive way. Right action is the same thing, using your actions in a constructive way, not a destructive way. And right livelihood, same thing, in a way that is constructive and makes the world better, not in a way that makes the world uh, worse, right? not in a destructive livelihood. And livelihood, I hear by like a job or your work. Typically, you start with the morality uh, paths um, because they provide a foundation that guides uh, the, the remaining paths. And let me give you an example of what happens when you don't follow or you don't have a good foundation of morality. Um, we saw in business this idea of mindfulness took off. And everyone was paying speakers to come in to teach their business uh, men and women uh, how to be mindful and how to be use that mindfulness to be more productive, how to be more mindful um, in order to beat your competitors, how to be more mindful in order to raise profits. And so what ended up happening is that these individuals may have learned to be more mindful, more self-aware, more aware of what's going on in them. But then what they've done with that extra superpower of mindfulness um, is engage in activities that were either a mix of healthy and unhealthy or were just flat out unhealthy. And so when we at least develop a good foundation of morality, it helps guide the what I like to call the superpower of mindfulness, the superpower of concentration and meditation. And when you can do that, it becomes easier then to um, become aware of uh, wisdom, which is the last two paths, all right? the wisdom uh, division. I'll leave it at that. So next week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the morality uh, division, uh, which is the right speech, right action, and right uh, livelihood. Uh, go more deeply into what each of them is and how you would try to apply each of those in your life. Actually, well, I do want to cover one more thing. When it comes to the word morality, you will find that in Buddhism, it tries to avoid good and bad and rather tries to focus on healthy, unhealthy, or skillful and unskillful. The reason is you could use good and bad, but you'd have to be very clear as to what you mean by good and bad. And so you could mean good, healthy, and skillful being synonymous. But in our culture, we tend to associate good and evil with God and the devil, or sin or, or virtue. And those, uh, the sin and virtue, sin, the word sin and virtue, tend to incorporate a, a judgmental element to it. And we find consistently in the scriptures of Buddhism that that judgment, being judgmental, is actually detrimental to our journey uh, towards enlightenment. So the reason we try to avoid the words good and bad is because we want to avoid a judgment. Instead, what we want to do is focus on the outcomes. So is it a healthy outcome or unhealthy outcome or even a mix? Is it bringing about less suffering in the world and in yourself? Is it helping others uh, be happier and less suffer less? So those are sort of the, the, the intent of using the word healthy and skillful as opposed to good. But if you're okay with the word good, fine. Just make sure you don't incorporate the judgmental aspect of it. When we look at morality in general outside of Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, um, uh, almost every religion, uh, you will find um, that the morality um, are pretty consistent. The messaging is pretty consistent. And typically, um, the more um, accepted rules of morality incorporate uh, 
uh, equality and reciprocity. Equality being that all are treated equally, all are expected to sort of meet the same rules. There's not like one person is um, has a, an advantage to being enlightened towards the other, or that one person has an advantage to get to heaven versus hell. Um, and so equality is that all are equal. Reciprocity is best captured by that golden rule. Treat others as you would have them treat you. And so we see that morality also in Buddhism, that guide that you want to do unto others what you would be okay with done unto you. Uh, and so those rules of morality, if you have experience in Christianity or Judaism, Islam or other religions, this is a way that you can incorporate and still use the lessons that you learn uh, to help guide your journey on morality. But hopefully, if you're going to pursue Buddhism without the judgmental aspect of it. So if you curse, and I, I'm bad about that, I curse a lot. Um, but one, I had a priest. Uh, I was with a bunch of priests, and there was uh, a couple of priests that were cursing with each other, and it shocked me. I was uh, I was 18, 19 years old. Like, oh my goodness, they're cursing. And the priest put it this way: if you use curse words to as a literary effect to enhance, that's okay. But when you're using curse words to belittle yourself or another, that's not okay. And so what this individual taught me was that um, if I take out the judgment and look at the effects of the use of those words, I can find that there are times when using those words really do seem appropriate. In fact, we have research showing that if you curse, you will be able to resist pain longer and recover from pain faster. So there's some benefits to it. There's a healthy element to cursing. But if I use the B word with a woman, or if I use the N word with an African American, those are very harmful words. And so those words would be unhealthy. So Buddhism asks you to not just sort of blanket everything's right or everything wrong, or it's all right or all wrong. Buddhism wants you to look deeper into the nuances of the actions, recognize that some of the actions are a mix of healthy and unhealthy, and that overall you want to try to do more healthy and unhealthy activities. And that what you learned in morality from either our society, from, from your social studies class and civics classes in school, or from your former or current religion outside of Buddhism can still be applicable. But now you want to focus this new perspective on what you've learned in the past to try and deepen your understanding of why those things were immoral or moral. And what are the subtle nuances? It's more challenging. It's the reason why, um, I mean, we know it's hard because it's so much easier to say Trump is evil and Biden is good. That's the easy way out. But Buddhism challenges us to see the good in Trump and the evil in Biden, the healthy and unhealthy aspects of Trump, the healthy and unhealthy aspects of Biden. It's challenging. It is hard, especially when there's so much emotion tied into it. But Buddhism challenges you and says you're not going to reach enlightenment as long as you stick to these simple black and white rules. It's not going to happen. All right. This time for real, I'll leave it there. Next time we meet, next week, we're going to talk about then, go more in depth as to the, these morality uh full of these sections morality section of the right speech right action right livelihood uh what they mean ways to think about it how to incorporate them into your life so that you can be a happier person right? and you will notice that the pattern should always be that not 
if I'm making myself happy, I make others happy. If I make others happy, I make myself happy. There is this interconnectedness between all of us. And so look for those things as I start teaching you about the, uh, the, uh, the specifics of each of the Eightfold Path. Um, there is an interconnectedness always uh, in, in the teachings of the Buddha. All right. well, thank you very much. I'll open it up now. If anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask any questions or make any comments, uh, now is the time to do it. So in the past, I've been taught that you should not necessarily begin, but with right intention, because then that would lead to speech and action. So what are your thoughts on that? Because that's different than what you said. So right intention. Uh, right intention is... Thought. Yeah, sorry. Right thought. That's the thing. So yeah, right intention has been translated as right effort, right thought. And again, it's kind of, it's that, it is that the beginning is wherever you choose it to be. If I look at a picture of a nebula, or if I were to somehow be able to go into space and and be in front of a nebula, where's the beginning of the nebula? If I were to um, look at the internet, if I were somehow able to see all the internet, where's the beginning of the internet? There is none. Okay? And so it's wherever you feel is the right beginning for you. And so if the teaching, that right thought, is the right place to begin, begin there. All right, if that teaching called to you and it seems right for you, do that. If my teaching that you start with morality feels right to you, then do that, okay? But always keep in the back of your mind that they are interconnected and that they each enhance each other, are connected with each other um, and can't be separated from each other if you are to achieve enlightenment. It's, it's difficult to put into words. And that's why we have to use imagery. That's why we have to use poetic language to try and describe it. Because it's just, it's not something that can be put into the English language. Okay. So wherever you feel is the best start for you, start there. But don't neglect the others. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? Thoughts, comments, questions? I was a little shocked. Sorry, I, I have a, some noise here. Okay. Uh, I was a little shocked that, you know, kind of like, it sounds like, you know, it's not black and white. It's just, there's an area for gray. It, it literally seems like it. and. You know, it's kind of like comforting in a really strange way. It's really comforting to know like, hey, you know what? Like, like it's not all bad or not all good. So that's just, you know. You will get, you will know that you will achieve deeper wisdom when not only is it comforting, but scary as shit. Yeah. And so that's what you want to, that's when you'll know that you've really understood it. You have started because that's where you start, the comfort. Oh, thank goodness. It's not so rigid. It's not all black and white. It's in the middle somewhere, the middle way. As you continue on the journey, I will tell you, there will be moments of OMG, this is tough. And so keep on doing what you're doing. The fact that you got uh, comfort at it is a good start. So keep that uh, feeling with you and keep deepening your understanding of what this means. Because that's a good start. Thank you. Anyone else? 